This is Aragog, Available Runtime Verification of Shardable Distributed Network Systems. And I'm going to go in a, a different order from the way that the paper described it. Um, I'm going to start off by describing the example system that they want to verify, then we'll talk about the workflow of the verification system. And then at the end of that, I'll talk about the uh, verification language. So the system that they want to verify is a distributed uh, network address translation gateway. And the way it works is like this. So um, a client makes a connection to the router and a, the first packet of a flow, this is basically a new connection or maybe it's a new UDP stream. Uh, the router sends it to a random packet worker. The packet worker uh, hashes the packet header. So that's source and destination, IP address and port, and also the um, protocol numbers. So these five things together are the IP header and uh, they're also called a five tuple. So the packet worker hashes those five things and comes up with which of the flow decider workers uh, should be responsible for this. The flow decider uh, chooses which server in the end it should go to and it replicates that mapping. Uh, it also tells, uh, it can determine which flow decider is going to receive the server's replies in the reverse flow. And so it tells that flow decider to be ready. And then that flow decider also replicates the reverse mapping. Uh, once all of this rather surprising amount of work has been done for the first packet of a connection, um, the flow decider can finally tell the packet worker that it's ready and then the packet worker can actually forward the packet to the server. And uh, I find this system very surprising, but it's not the point of this paper. This is just the example system. Um, this, we want to check that that whole protocol works correctly. So the researchers have designed Aragog to uh, check invariance in what they call network functions like this one. So their goals for Aragog are they want to do runtime invariant checking in a production system. Uh, they want to do that with an expressive language so that you don't have to hand code new invariants in some low level programming language. Um, they want it to be scalable. So if you throw more hardware at Aragog, it should be able to process more events. And it should also be cheaper than the system that it's checking, so you can run it in real time. They are willing to give up some accuracy in exchange for making their system cheaper and more scalable if necessary. And for some reason, they want real-time alerting. I find this a weird goal, but we can talk about that more at the end. So they've got this expressive language for uh, describing invariant violations that you want to check. And this is the one that they use as their main example. So the first part, the filter, uh, is a uh, kind of a quick front-end filter. And um, what they're checking is they only want to look for events that either add or remove a mapping from uh, a flow decider machine. Uh, so the worker type is FD, it's a flow decider. They're then going to group by the five tuple of the IP header. So everything that gets through these first two clauses, the output of that is a stream of messages that all have the same source destination and proto protocol. 
uh, and they are only of these add or remove message types. So the match expression down at the bottom, it receives streams of receives streams of messages that all have the same uh, source and destination IP and port. And then they match uh, a stream of messages. And if there is a match, then that means that the invariant has been violated. So what we are checking here, uh, we are looking for the following pattern. Uh, that first line event type equals add, at $x means that a uh, this flow has been added to the server at location x, so a particular flow decider. Um, that's followed by second line, some number of remove messages at some other flow decider. So you see the asterisk, the star at the end, that's like other regular expressions, this is zero or more messages that match this pattern. And then the final line says that there is a add message that is also not at location X. Uh, why is this an invariant? This would be the event, this would be a situation in which a flow mapping is added to a particular flow decider, and then it's also added to another flow decider without first being removed from the first flow decider. So this would be a uh, data conflict if you see a stream of events that match this pattern. Hope that's fairly clear. Uh, this is a regular expression in the sort of um, sophomore computer science sense. It's not a Perl regular expression, but it actually has some, um, uh, some resemblance to that kind of regular expression also. Right, uh, the thing we we're checking for is that there's an add at location X, some number of removes not at X, and then an add at some location that is not X. So Aragog is a system for taking an invariant violation spec like this one and applying it to events that are generated by a whole distributed system. And they want this checking to be fairly cheap, uh, scalable, and they want to catch violations very soon after they occur. So they need some sort of big event processing architecture. And their architecture is like this. So, uh, one particular machine is the blue box. You could imagine, say, that a flow decider machine uh, has all of the components in the blue box. So there's the network function, which is what the actual distributed system is doing. Um, in the case of the flow decider, it's deciding where to forward packets to. So that's the program that, that is the subject of our checking. And Somebody has manually instrumented the network function, added code, so that it exports events as they occur into a Kafka queue. Uh, so that's that event with timestamp line. And notice that they're assuming very precise clock synchronization um, using, I think, the PTP protocol. And the assumption here is that within your network, you can ensure good enough clock synchronization that um, causally related events can be properly sorted by timestamp. Uh, we saw last week in the Sundial paper that this is possible, but in their evaluation system, they didn't actually have this set up. Um, so instead of relying on clock synchronization, they kind of post-processed um, their events to make sure that they came out in the right order before they were analyzed. So I think it's sort of a theoretical possibility that you could use precise timestamps and verify streams of events in real time, but that's not actually what their evaluation found. Um, so the network function exports events 
and those go through uh, various stages that are specified by the invariant violations. Uh, we saw a filter. If it doesn't match the filter, then it's discarded. Uh, there are mapping stages where you can basically declare variables. Uh, there are grouping stages. We saw that um, this spec groups messages by their IP headers. Uh, and then there's this suppression step, which is really interesting, where if a local verifier can determine that the event um, is not relevant to the global invariant, then it can discard that event. We'll talk about that more later. Uh, if it's not suppressed, then the stream is forwarded to the global state machines, and they're using a stream processing framework called Apache Flink, uh, and they are doing the actual um, invariant violation checking. Uh, one point here is that if your global state machines get overwhelmed, uh, or you don't want to spend enough on hardware to check everything, then you can take a subsample of all of the groups produced by the group by statements on all of the local machines and only process those. So you might miss some invariant violations in some of the streams, but each of the streams that you do sample will be a complete stream. And so you'll be able to accurately analyze it. Uh, that seems like a good compromise to me since um, if you've got a bug in your network function, that bug is probably violating invariance thousands of times, so you'll catch it eventually. So if we go back to the uh, regular expression that we saw earlier, how does Aragog split up the processing of this into each of these stages at the local and global level? Um, Every regular expression is equivalent to a non-deterministic finite state automaton, um, as I sort of remember learning in college. And so Aragog's first step is to generate this automaton from the match expression. Um, the filter is uh, not shown here. Um, I don't know if they do that using a automaton or not. Um, but the filter and the group by are not shown here. So this automaton assumes that it's only processing events that have passed through the filter and that it is only processing events in one group. So <clears throat> as we uh, go through the state transitions in this automaton, we know that uh, the value of rho which is the current location, is always going to be the same for every event that this particular automaton sees. Uh, and we also know that um, source and destination IP and port and protocol are also always the same for every event that this particular machine sees. Uh, for other locations and other streams, they'll have their own instance of the automaton, and then um, those variables will have different values. The uh, machine is kind of inverted. Uh, we normally think of acceptance as good, but in fact, if you can reach the accept state at the end of the machine, that's an invariant violation, and it indicates that there is a bug in your network function. There's this really interesting idea of suppressible events that a automaton running on a local uh, network function server um, can suppress because it knows that they won't matter to the global invariant checker. And that works like this. So if you look at this machine, you can see that um, a state transition from the start state to state one, this could matter to a global state machine. So you do forward this event from the local machine to the global verifier. But self loops like this one, don't matter to the global state machine. If there is a violation in this stream, it is still there even if you remove this particular state transition. 
Uh, and therefore this state transition is suppressed and it's not passed to the global verifier. Um, self loops are obviously suppressible. I think that's pretty clear, but there's a more general principle that um, if you make a transition and after you've made that transition, the paths available from your state to the accept state are the same as they were before you made that transition, then this is a suppressible transition. Um, that's just another way of saying this transition does not matter uh, for the sake of violation checking. The paper describes a bunch of other transformations of these state machines on the way from um, parsing the uh, regular expression to generating a uh, local and a global state machine. There's a couple of more steps in here that I'm skipping over, but since this is not a programming language group and I'm not a programming language person, I'm going to uh, ignore those for now. So their evaluation, um, they tested both this example system that we talked about, the uh, network address translation gateway. They also tested it against a distributed firewall and a DHCP server. They wanted to prove that their system was flexible and general. Uh, they found four invariants that their system violates, which indicates probably I don't know, some number of bugs in the implementation. And because of those bugs, they found thousands and thousands of violations over the course of, I think, millions of messages in a half hour trace. Uh, they were post-processing events after the fact, but the goal of the system is to do real-time processing. Uh, I think that's true. They, uh, found they didn't tell us how much CPU on the NatGW system was spent on Aragog, but 20% on the firewall servers. Um, it scales linearly uh, because it's sort of embarrassingly parallel at the global level. You can verify each stream individually from all of the others. And so you can scale up as much as you want by adding global verifier nodes. And they found it, I think that this statistic comes from the NatGW system that local filtering and suppression reduce traffic to global verifiers by about three quarters. Um, and then also that uh, if this, yeah, I guess maybe they must have been running it in real time on at least one of these tests because they have this stat that it only took milliseconds from the event that caused an invariant violation to the time that Aragog detected that violation. So we can look at their goals and see if they met them, and I think they did. Uh, they wanted runtime invariant checking, um, and they may have evaluated this. It certainly seems like it could be used for that. Um, they wanted an expressive language for writing down invariants, and I think that that's one of the big strengths of this paper. Uh, they wanted it to be scalable and cheaper than the system it's checking. I think they demonstrated that, uh, even at the cost of some lack of accuracy. And they also have this goal of near real-time alerts, uh, which is the most confusing thing to me. I really, um, since an invariant violation is an indication that you have a bug, in your implementation, it seems like uh, it's going to take you days to fix the bug. So whether you find it one second or five seconds after the bug has manifested does not seem to matter to me because there's no automatic response that they mention to catching an invariant violation. It's not like you immediately shut down the server or something. So I don't get why they want alerts to be uh, so quick. Um, my feeling about this is that the uh, I've read other papers about uh, real-time invariant checking in distributed systems. Uh, compared to those, it seems to me that 
the expressive language is a big strength here. I haven't seen um, something that seems as natural to non-experts to be able to write invariants. And I think that the automatic work distribution where um, local and global servers are able to efficiently split the work between them automatically based on the contents of the invariant, uh, that seems pretty novel to me. Um, I noticed that this is not an automatic system. You still have to exp uh, exercise your judgment. You have to write the invariant expressions. Uh, you also have to have some foresight about where the bugs are going to be in your protocol. And you have to export events from your network functions to write that code yourself in order to catch those bugs in the areas where you're expecting to see bugs. So I could still see you getting bitten by what you don't know you don't know. Um, the, like I said, real-time invariant checking seems important to them, but I don't understand why that is. Uh, I, I also wonder um, if the system violates an invariant, but it doesn't uh, result in any sort of outage that any other monitoring uh, mechanism would catch. Do you actually care about the invariant violation or not? Um, I'm not sure the, the value of catching invariant vi violations in production. Um, I'm also curious, they're focused on uh, network functions, which are pretty simple protocols with small, large numbers of small messages. Uh, I'm curious whether you could uh, generalize this to higher level, more complex protocols, like could you check that transactions are strictly serializable? Um, it might be that either you couldn't express that invariant in their language uh, conveniently. Um, I mean, it's probably Turing complete, but uh, it might be, there might be some things that are easier to write the check for than others. But um, I also wonder if you have a very large number of variables in your uh, invariant expression, whether that would tend to um, explode the uh, work that the global verifiers have to do um, in order to check that no possible assignments of those variables uh, result in an invariant violation. Um, so there might be some sort of uh, kind of state space explosion type problem there. Um, the system looks like it could be productized. Uh, people who did not build it could probably use it because of this expressive language and because a lot of the system is nicely automated. So it does seem like it could be used by industry at large, um, but I kind of wonder, uh, <laughs> If real-time invariant checking is of ambiguous value, uh, and if you can only check invariants for fairly simple protocols, uh, I wonder if the niche is actually large enough for something like this to turn into a product. And uh, that's it for me. I'm curious what you think. Well, uh, thanks for the presentation, Jesse.